excited about after service, we're going to have a, a, an interest meeting for our mission trip coming up to Belize. And I'm excited because we had to cancel a lot of things for the summer. Uh, among them was our, our planned mission trip to Ecuador. And so we're planning on getting back on track. And in, in January 2021, we have a trip planned to Belize. Uh, I hope you'll stick around for after the service so that you can find out about what God is doing in Belize and what we are partnering with him as we look to head that way. And I want to let you know, if you want to come with us, you're going to need one of these. In fact, not just if you want to go to Belize. If you want to leave the country and go anywhere else, you are going to need one of these. This is a passport. This is specifically my passport. Uh, it's a very old passport. I'm not sure if you can like, see the picture, but I was like five when I got this one. And so when I go to the passport office, if I were to attempt to use this passport, they would simply say, that's not you. Uh, you are an old, creepy man uh, with a little boy's passport. You see, this passport designates you as a citizen, and it stipulates where you can and cannot go. And, and if you just can't just walk into a border and be like, hi, I'm here for a trip. No, you actually need one of these if you're going to travel between countries. And, and when you open it up, when you get to this country you're going to, when you get out of the airport, there will be two lines when you finally get off the plane. One will say citizens, and one will say non-citizens. And depending on which country you're visiting and where you're a citizen of, you have to get in that designated line. Because as a citizen, you have certain rights to the country you belong to. As a citizen, you have certain uh, privileges you get to go. In fact, uh, I want to read this. I'm not sure if you've ever read the fine print of your passport, but there's a lot of fine print on here. And it simply says this. The Secretary of the State of the United States of America hereby commands all who concern this permit to the citizen, the National of the United States, named herein to pass without delay or hindrance in case of need to give all lawful aid and protection. It's basically saying, hey, if you bear one of these, you are a citizen of the United States, and if you go to a different country and you go to a consulate and you show one of these, that that consulate has to give you all the help and aid that you require. Why? Because you are a citizen and there are certain rights. In the same way, you can change your citizenship. I know that several friends, we've walked through that process with you as you became a citizen of the United States of America. You may have been born somewhere else and you became what's referred to as a nationalized citizen. Several of you have gone through that. And, and there's an oath that you take when you become a citizen. That you stand up in front of your, I guess, strangers, um, and in front of a flag and you make a promise that oath kind of reads like this. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty to which I have herefore to have been subject or a citizen. You see, becoming a citizen of one country means you become a foreigner of every other country. If you decide that, man, wouldn't it be cool to wear kilts? I'm going to move to Scotland and become a Scottish citizen. You would have to renounce your American citizenship. The same is true as if you decide kilts aren't for me and you moved from Scotland to come back to America. You see, the same thing happens when you become a citizen of heaven. And that's what Paul's going to address today in the book of Philippians chapter 3 as we continue. He talks about when you become a citizen of heaven, then you start to look different from everyone else in, on earth. You have a different culture. You have a different mindset when you become a citizen of heaven. If you would, open up your Bibles to the book of Philippians. I hope by now you're familiar with the book of Philippians if you've been journeying through this. I hope you know where to find it. But if you don't, the book of Philippians is towards the back of your Bible. It's with the Ian's books. We got books like Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians. You're going to find Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 17. And we're going to read uh, through the end of chapter 3 and get into chapter 4 today. We're almost in the last chapter. We only have about three more weeks in the book of Philippians. And we can cross another book off our list. And it simply reads like this. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. Just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Do me a favor, circle, highlight, or underline the word live in your Bible. It says, keep your eyes on those who live, or your translation may say walk. Keep your eyes on those who walk as we do. He goes, for as I have often told you before and now tell you again with many tears, Many live as enemies of the cross, or many walk as enemies of the cross. Circle, highlight, or underline that word, live or walk again. Paul's going to talk about two different ways you can live in this world, or two different walks that you have if you're trying to follow Jesus. 
And he says, they're, uh, he says, as for the enemies of the cross, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. Circle, highlight, or underline that word, citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. He writes to the Philippians and he goes, you are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That would have been meaningful to the Philippians. They would have had a different understanding of citizenship because Philippi, even though it was seven to 800 miles away from Rome, Philippi was a colony of Rome. Rome, of course, is in Italy and on the Italian peninsula. And Philippi was on what was then known as Macedonia, modern day Greece, on a Greek peninsula, about seven to 800 miles away. Yet they were a colony of Rome. And what that means is, when the people of Philippi would have tucked their kids into bed, they would have not told them stories about the local heroes. They would have told them stories about the glory of Rome. They would have dressed as Romans. They would have had Roman culture, spoken the Roman language. And they would have looked different from everybody else on this peninsula of Macedonia because they did not belong to Macedonia. They were a colony of Rome. In the same way, Paul says, you are citizens of heaven. You should look different. You see, when I tuck my kids into bed at night, I don't tell them all the glory of the Irish people. You know, which is, ever, you ever have that assignment when you grow up as kids? You know, or your kids have this assignment now. They're like, hey, write a, a paper on your heritage and your culture. And my kids come home and they're like, hey, what's my heritage and culture? I'm like, well, you are a mutt. I, your father was a mutt and your mother was a mutt. You've got Irish and Lithuanian and, and, and different things on your father's side, and your mother is like Swedish and Scandinavian. We don't even know what you are. But when I say, listen, none of that has impacted your culture because everything we teach you, everything we try and bring you up in is this culture of, of heaven. You see, when we tuck my kids into bed at night, I, I tell them stories of, uh, of Jesus. I tell them stories of Paul. I tell them stories of, uh, of Moses and, and Jacob. And I tell them stories from Scripture. I say, these are your people. See, these, this is our heritage because God wants to make a people for himself. He wants to make a nation for himself. Out of every tribe, tongue, and nation from around the world, God wants to make citizens of heaven. And that's our identity. That's who we are. But Paul mentions another group in this passage, and they're fake citizens. They're pretenders. Uh, there's another fine print in this passport. Let's see if I can find it again. It simply says this, notice... This passport must not be used by any person other than the person of whom it, to is, it is issued. Uh, or if you violate these conditions or restrictions placed herein in violation of the rules and regulations ensuring of this passport, any willful violation of these laws or mutilation or changing of this passport will result in full prosecution under the law. Under Title 18, United States Code, Section 1544. And it simply says this, this passport is issued to Matt Brennan. Nobody else is allowed to use this passport. He is the citizen we are allowing to leave. And it simply means this. If you're planning a trip out of the country, I can't say to you, that's a lot of trouble to get a passport. Just take mine. Just cut out my picture, post in yours, and, and go. That's called fraud. And it says in here, if you do that, you will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law because you are pretending to be a citizen. It is unlawful for anyone other than the original recipient to use this passport. Why is there a need to put that in there? Uh, it's simply because you could take out your, my picture, put in yours, change the name, change the signature, and that's a great way to get arrested. And Paul mentions we have a problem because there are fake citizens. He's talked about it two to three times so far in Philippians. Hey, he mentioned it in chapter 1. He said, some preach Christ out of envy and selfish ambition... He mentioned it at the top of chapter 3, which we talked about last week. He says, be careful of those dogs, those, those workers of evil works. He says, those mutilators of the flesh. And now he calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. He says, there are people in the church who pretend to walk with Jesus, but they're really enemies, and you need to be aware of it. There are opposers in every church you go to who don't really follow Jesus. And it's hard for us to see. It's hard for us to accept. 
I had a really hard time preparing this message this week because I'm like, I, I don't think this is relevant to us. I, I don't really know if I want to teach this. It's difficult. And he simply says this, join together, my brothers, because Paul is going to talk about two different walks and how you can find out if you are a real citizen of heaven or if you're just faking it and how you recognize that in other people's life. Paul was trying to speak to the Philippians. Here's how you cult-proof your church to keep it free from bad theology, to keep it free from people who want to come in and lead you astray because Jesus warned us. He goes, there will be those who come to you like false prophets and they'll come to you like wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. They'll look like Christians, but they're only there to, to lead you astray. They're there to prey on you. And they're not really following the commands of Jesus Christ. And you need to know them when you see them. You need to be able to recognize bad doctrine when you see it. And so Paul will warn the Philippians. He says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. Just as you have us for a model, keep your eyes on those who live like we do. Now, Paul is not being arrogant here. He's not saying, listen, I'm the only one. Follow me. Like, that's it. the first time I read this, I thought, man, Paul is so arrogant. He's like, follow me because I'm just like Jesus. No, that's not what Paul's saying. We, we read it last week in the chapter above this, in chapter 3. He, said, uh, he says, not that I've already obtained all of this or that I've already achieved it. And he's saying, listen, keep your eyes on Jesus, but if you don't know how to walk like a Christian, then follow my example or follow the people who are living like we are. He says, follow Timothy, follow Epaphroditus. He goes, these guys are the real deal. Who is it that you can look to for an example of what the Christian life is really supposed to be like? Paul says, not just, those, not just us, but those who walk like we do. Paul has been writing in the book of Philippians. He says, I want you to be humble. I want you to serve others. I want you to live this Christian life with joy. Who is it who is living out what we've read so far in the book of Philippians in your life? Who can you look back to in your history or past? Who did you want to be like when you grow up? This idea that someone would just love Jesus so much. Who was the most humble person you've ever met? Who is the most joyful person you've ever met? Who is the person who is the best servant of Jesus Christ and his people that you've ever met? You see, we have to ask that question today because Paul's saying, I want you to look at their lives and I want you to imitate them. You see, as Christians, we need partners in the gospel. We need people to imitate. We need examples to encourage us, to show us how to walk. In scripture, we call it discipleship. Someone who will come and not put themselves on a pedestal and say, live like I do, but will come and put themselves beside you and say, imitate me. I'm going to show you how to walk in this Christian life. Because as partners, we need to keep one another from being led astray. We need to walk with one another. So why do we need examples? Because many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And I want you to see this. Paul goes, listen, in the Philippian church, your church has been invaded and there are people who are walking and living as enemies of the cross in your midst. And Paul's not angry. Did you see that? He continues in verse 18. He says, I've told you often before and I'm telling you again with many tears. Many live as enemies of the cross. And in the, in the Greek, Paul writes, he says, even as I'm writing this, I am weeping. I tell you now, weeping as I'm writing this, many are living as enemies of the cross. You see, Paul isn't angry. He's broken over this. And it occurred to me this week how odd it is to see weeping in the book of Philippians. It's this book we've been talking about that's such joy. And of everything that's breaking Paul's heart, it's not the fact that he's in prison. It's not the fact that he's been abandoned by his friends. It's not the fact that he doesn't have anyone around him to like, come beside him. There are lots of reasons for Paul to be upset right now. And he goes, you know what breaks my heart? You know what drives me to tears? Is that there are people who think they're following Jesus Christ, but they don't really know him. And Paul is broken as he writes this. We wrote it down this week on your Creek Notes. Something really important for us to all watch out for. Watch out for those who devalue the cross. What scripture calls enemies of the cross. Watch out for those who devalue the cross. When we say devalue the cross, what we're referring to is those who devalue the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
Paul had written about this previously in chapter 3, and he said these workers, these evildoers, what they want to come in and they want to say, yes, Jesus died for you, but you have to earn your salvation. And that devalues the cross. It says that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was not enough. That, that Jesus Christ dying for you and forgiving your sins was not enough. This is the gospel, friends. You see, we have been separated from God by our sin. You see, God is up in heaven and he is perfect. And nothing imperfect can ever enter into his presence. So we are eternally separated from God. And scripture is very clear in the book of Romans chapter 3 and chapter 6. It says, the wages of sin meaning missing the mark, the wages of us being imperfect and not following Jesus Christ is death. See, we are all doomed to die. We were created to live in eternity with God, and yet our sin separates us for, from him eternally. But God loved us so much that he sent his only son, John chapter 3, verse 16, that anyone who believes in him would not perish, meaning would not die, but have everlasting life. And, and the gospel is clear that Jesus Christ came to forgive us of our sins because there's nothing you could ever do to be good enough to earn your way back into God's graces. You cannot earn a place with God because once you've become imperfect, you can never be made perfect again. Think about it like a piece of art. If, it is, if, if there is a perfect art, let's take the Mona Lisa, and you are to try and imitate the Mona Lisa. Depending on your level of artistry, you might do a better job than me. Mine would look like a stick figure and kind of a weird crooked smile. There's not much I could do to imitate it, and it would not be perfect. You see, my best efforts would not measure up to the standard by which I'm trying to meet. And you might be the best art forger in the world. If so, talk to us about joining our art ministry team. Uh, put that talent to good use instead of evil. But no matter how good you are, you would never be able to measure up to the standard and perfectly imitate what you were after. And the very nature of being perfect, which God is, means that imperfection cannot come into his presence because anytime imperfection comes into perfection, it brings its imperfection into perfection, which means God can't allow anything imperfect around him. It's as in his very nature. It doesn't work. Imperfection is eradicated in God's presence. And therefore, our sin leads us to death. But God loved us so much that he gave his son to die on the cross. You see, he took upon our iniquities, our sin, our punishment, our imperfection, and he paid the price of death for us so that we might not have to die. We could have eternal life through Christ with him in heaven. And he says, and those who come around and say, devalue the cross, basically it means that they're coming around and saying, you can earn your way into heaven. Here are the works that you have to do. Here are the stipulations that God places on you being able to get to him. And Paul says, listen, it's only God's grace. Hey, it's not your works. It's not about your own self-righteousness. There's nothing you can do to earn it. And these guys, therefore, are coming in as enemies of the cross. Because the cross of Christ stood for grace and mercy and forgiveness and the fact that it was given to us. And those who say you have to earn it don't understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he goes, they are enemies of the cross. And it drives him to weeping. He says, there are false citizens. It's all over scripture, by the way. It's not just unique to Philippi. Jesus warned us about it. He says, false prophets will come to you they're wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. In the book of 2 Peter, which is only three chapters long, he spends two chapters devoted to false teachers. He spends two chapters devoted to fake Christians who infiltrate the church and try and lead people astray. And in the book of 1 Timothy, Timothy, who is in Ephesus at the time, he writes to Timothy and says, hey, Hymenaeus and Alexander, he goes, I've given them over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. I don't even know what that means. Whatever it was, is these two guys were coming in and they were leading the church astray from grace and forgiveness. Whatever they were doing. And Paul's like, you can't afford to have them in there. And Paul is weeping and he says, I've, I've given them over to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme and come back. Jesus told the story this way in Matthew chapter 13. He said, there was a man who went out and he planted a field full of wheat and he was like, oh, I'm going to get a good crop. He understood the principles. 
If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. So he sowed a lot. And he says, man, this is going to be a great crop of wheat. And at night, an enemy came in. And he sowed tares along with the wheat. A tear, by the way, is a plant that looks just like wheat, except for it has no wheat. It grows up just the same. The stalk is identical, except for when you get there, there is no fruit to it. So somewhere about six months later, as the wheat's supposed to be coming up, the workers went out into the field and they came back to the master and they said, you planted good seed, right? Because there's a whole lot of bad seed growing up in amongst your flock. What, what just happened? And the master said, an enemy came and did this. Worst practical joke of all time. He says, whoever did this is an enemy. And they said, well, what do you want us to do? You want us to like tear out the tares? You want us to get rid of the bad stuff? We can do that. And the master said, no. He says, if you do that, you'll tear out the good stuff with it. He goes, I, I, I don't want to lose my crop. And said, wait till the end and we'll shift between the two of them. Those that produce fruit and those that don't. Those that are the good harvest and those that aren't. Those that are real and those that aren't. And Jesus interpreted the parable. He says, the enemy that comes around is Satan. And he goes, and the fruit, the, this field is the church. And he says, there is a good harvest and there is people that don't really, they look just like Christians. They speak the same language. They sit in the same pews. But their heart is not given over to Jesus Christ. And he goes, they come in and they're part of every church in the world. And he says, you need to know the difference because there are fake citizens and you are called to be citizens of heaven. So who specifically is he talking about? You see, there were two groups that were a problem for Paul. One was the legalists. They followed Paul everywhere. We've talked about this already. They followed Paul everywhere. Everywhere Paul was go, the legalists were sure to go. And so they followed behind him and simply said, listen, you need Jesus and you have to earn your salvation. Jesus came to forgive you. Yeah, that's right. But you have to earn it for yourself. And then there were the Gnostics who came behind Paul. The Gnostics were the one who said, listen, your, your spirit is good, but your body is inherently evil. And therefore, whatever's happening in your spirit is separate from your body. So you can do whatever you want to with your body, and you're fine. You see, well, the legalist said you have to obey the law. The Gnostic says there is no law. You can do whatever you want to. And Paul is saying, okay, these guys are wrong over here. These guys are wrong over here. It's all about God's grace. But because we have his grace, we should be different people where we're now citizens of the kingdom of heaven and we should look different and live different. And you still to this day have people on the other side who want to pull you one way or the other. And Paul says, you have to watch how you walk. And he says, if you don't know how to do it, think about those who set your eyes on those who walk with humility and with service and with joy and keep Jesus the center of their lives. He goes, imitate those guys. My original question when getting to the next verse was, okay, how do you recognize the good from the bad? How do you recognize the good fruit from the bad fruit? But then I realized there's a more pressing question. How do you know which one you are? Because I'm willing to bet the people who are just here and aren't really citizens, they still think they're in. Because Jesus said in, in, in the book of Matthew, again, chapter 23 or 25, he said, many will come to me on that last day when we separate the wheat from the tares. And many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do many wonderful things in your name? And he goes, I'll reply to them, I never knew you. You see, there are lots of people who call Jesus Lord, but do not know him, but do not walk with him. They only know the story of God, but they do not have a personal relationship with him. So how do you know which one you are? And the most important question you can ask yourself is this. Has my passport been stamped with the blood of Jesus Christ? Because that is what seals you. That is how you know. How are you good with God? Do you, have you ever given your life over to Jesus Christ and said, I'm giving you everything and my life belongs to you? Because unless you have been sealed, and Scripture says we have to be sealed with the Holy Spirit, have you received the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you know the Holy Spirit is in your life? Do you know it's because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross? Because you could never be a good enough person. Paul will, however, give us a couple of red flags, marks of the enemies of the cross. He'll say this, and we wrote this down in your Creek Notes too. It says, enemies claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. And he says, but their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame, and their focus is on earthly things. 
And he says, by contrast, those whose citizenship is in heaven. I had you circle, highlight, or under all that line of word, citizenship, by the way. The word citizenship is a unique word in scripture. In fact, the word citizenship is actually used a lot in scripture. But the word that he uses here is not the same word he uses for citizenship. The word he uses here is the word, uh, that's why I wrote it down. It's uh, polytenuma. Okay? The word is polytenuma, which is the word for politics. He says, your politics are of heaven. Just a quick side note about our politics and our culture. I could divide this room right now by bringing up politics. Every single issue that our world divides on today, it seems to be a political issue. And it's crazy because we try and keep that out of church. But I want to let you know, the minute we bring politics into it, you can have people who are like, oh, yeah, we're all united in Christ, but we bring up a political issue and watch how fast we divide. How many of the people you argue with on Facebook are fellow Christians? Man, politics can divide us. And so he's very clear. He says, no, 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 no. Your politics, do you want to know what your politics should be? Because more than being a Democrat or a Republican, you know what you should be? Your politics should be of heaven. Because if we are citizens of heaven, and therefore we are foreigners to the world, why do we get so caught up in the politics of a foreign country? How many of you care about the politics of New Zealand? How many of you care about the politics of Australia? Maybe you're like, okay, I'm thinking about moving there. I'm actually researching the politics a little bit. It says, but it says, he says, listen, but you are citizens of heaven. He goes, why are you getting involved in these other things? You see, I want to be very clear on this too. Scripture does tell us in the book of Jeremiah, pray for the country in which you live. He's talking to the, uh, the, the Jews at the time who were exiled into Babylon. They were taken away from their home country and they're living in Babylon. And God instructs them, pray for the prosperity of Babylon because you ain't going anywhere for a while. He goes, make your home here because it's where you are. And he goes, but don't confuse it for your home. You're just passing through. How many of your political opinions are formed not by Republican or Democrat, but by Scripture? Sorry, that's just a quick aside. I really had to hit because it's in the book and it's like super relevant to our culture today. He says, pray for the land that you are in, but do not confuse your politics because your politics are about the kingdom of heaven. And he goes, oh, and the problem is, church, we have so many Christians who care more about the politics of the land than the politics of heaven. We can lose sight over our goal that we are here to win a world and spread the message of Jesus Christ. And we think, oh, we're here to advocate for our political party. And we have a world that is so divided. And we've talked about Paul's prayer and Paul's uh, pleading with the church, be united in a time like this because then people will see you're different from your culture. People will see you're different from your world when you're united. And we can only be united when we have more of an emphasis on heaven when we have more of an emphasis on leading people to Christ than we do on other worldly politics. He says, your politics, you are citizens of heaven. You become a citizen of heaven when you trust in Jesus Christ. And he writes your name down in his book of life and comes into your heart and grants you the Holy Spirit. And he says, but the enemy of cross, he says, their destiny is destruction. It's what we talked about earlier where he says, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. You see, God loved the world so much that he sent his only son that you might not perish, that your end might not be destruction. And to give us this eternal life, and did you catch it? He tells us the end of citizens. It's at the end of this passage. He says, the, their end is destruction, the enemies of the cross, the Christ. But he says, as for us, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, circle this, where it says, the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I want to let you know, the power that enables Jesus to bring everything under his control is the resurrection. And he says, this is our destiny for citizens. Our end is not destruction. Our end is resurrection. And he goes, he will transform our lowly, humble, or if you read the King James Version, our vile bodies to be like his glorified body. Remember when Jesus Christ rose from the dead? 
He's, he, suddenly he was able to just like walk through walls. The disciples are all in a room. They lock the doors. They're like, nobody's getting in. And Jesus like, Psh, walks through walls. I don't know what happens with the resurrection, but walking through walls is going to be a cool one. Okay? That's nothing compared to what's next because every time Jesus was like around his disciples, he would suddenly appear and suddenly disappear. How many of you are looking forward to teleportation powers with the resurrection? Like, I want that one. I'm like, I'm going to visit wherever I want to. I'm being in the mountains. I'll see you all in five minutes. I'll be back. You see, he says, we will have the same glorified body of Christ. I don't know what that looks like. See, sometimes practically we forget about the resurrection. We, we adopt this, this Greek Platonic view, which Platonic, by the way, way, means the philosophy of Plato, who is not the philosophy of Scripture, by the way. We have a Platonic view of the body and the soul. It's what the Gnostics had. They said the soul is bad, and or sorry, the soul is good, the body is bad. So when you die, your body will decay and your soul goes up to heaven. That is not what the Bible teaches. It says that there will be a resurrection of the body meaning you will receive a new body. We won't be disembodied spirits in heaven. We will have a body. We will resurrect physically. And it says, by the same power that Christ calls everything into his control, which is his power of resurrection, we will also be resurrected and we will get glorified bodies. Now, I don't know if that gets, uh, means I get a new body or this body just gets an upgrade. I think either way, I get abs when I die. Like, I'm looking forward to it. People didn't often recognize Jesus after he resurrected. It took them a while of being with him. They're like, no way, you're Jesus. And he's like, I know. But they had a hard time recognizing him, even with the holes in his wrists. I don't know what that means. And so sometimes people will ask, well, if we're, this is actually the scripture we use when people say, well, is it okay to be cremated? Do we have to be buried? What happens? And this is the great thing about this. Like people ask, like, what happens if your body is eaten by sharks? Like, do those people, like, like, what happens? Are you digested and do you still raise? And this is the thing. The power that enables Jesus to bring all things under his control is the power of resurrection that he gives to us to transform our bodies. Meaning, if, for people who are cremated, will they be resurrected? Yes. Because Jesus is not going to be stopped by hydration levels or, like, location where you scattered your ashes. He says, no, 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 all things are under my command. In Revelation, it says that the sea will give up its dead, meaning if you have been like digested by fish, you're still going to resurrect somehow, and the sea will give up your body in this glorified form. I don't know how that happens. It's going to be really weird. I always picture it like in reverse. I actually think, you know, for those that are buried, I always thought, well, it's going to be kind of be cool, except for you're going to like raise. Maybe you can, because you can go through walls, the coffin won't be a problem. You'll be out of there. You just kind of be there in your new body. But I always thought if you were like cremated, it'd be a cooler effect. Like, just, just movie effects. Like, the ashes come back together, swirl around. There's kind of a reverse burning thing, and suddenly uh, you're, like, put together. This is all in Matt's imagination. I don't know how it happens. But Jesus says, no, no, no. Our end is resurrection. It doesn't matter what else has happened. And so you have to have a resurrected mentality. He says that those who do not know Jesus Christ, those who are fake citizens, their end is a destruction. And he goes, you see your end, right? It's resurrection. We have to be clear on this. The next thing he says is their God is their stomach. Uh, that took me a while too. At first I thought this was about dietary laws and I found a lot of theologians who were like, oh, it's all about what you can and cannot eat and they'll be these things. I, I actually tend to lean more towards me because I don't suffer with what I eat. I eat everything. And, and I wondered if that was more what it was addressing for me anyway. Their God is their stomach, meaning they give in to immediate gratification whatever pleases them for the moment, whatever they want for the moment, whatever seizes their interest of the moment, that's what their God is. That's what they chase. And a little bit of conviction came to me because that's how I eat. It's like, oh man, how often is my God in my stomach? And it's not about, oh, you overeat. It's about having this mindset that says, whatever pleases me in the here and now, that's what I'm going to chase. Whatever pleases my carnal flesh, whatever I want to give into at the moment, that's what I'm going to give into as opposed to having a resurrection mentality. See, when you have a resurrection mentality, it's playing the long game. It's this idea that, hey, I am not living for this moment. I'm not living in the now. I'm living for the Jesus Christ who is my Savior who's coming back. And the opposite of having your God is your stomach chasing whatever pleases you in this life is having your Savior, Jesus Christ. 
See, that's what it says. It says, we, on the other hand, are gods at our stomach, but we look to heaven from where our Savior is going to come. And I love this because it doesn't say our hope is in heaven. It says, no, 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 no. Our hope is in Jesus. He's just coming from heaven. So how do I keep myself from being so concerned about whatever I want to chase now? How do I keep myself from following this, this whatever pleases me for the moment? And Paul says, you have to focus on Jesus. You have to focus on heaven. You have to be able to focus on others. You see, we live in a time where it is so important to stop and to listen and to love and to serve my community more than myself. It's what Paul has been getting at through this whole book. He says, if you want to follow an example, follow Jesus' example that he had everything in heaven and he humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. He goes, we have to humble, we have to serve, we have to put others first. Because when your God is your stomach, you're just doing whatever pleases you. Not just physically, but whatever makes you happy. He goes, but for those of us who are keeping our eyes on Jesus, we realize that it's not about us, but it's about his citizenship. And it's about bringing other people into his kingdom. Because when Paul is saying, man, they're, they're enemies of the cross in your church, our response to the enemies of the cross is not like, get out of our church! It should be, no, come closer. Come nearer so you understand who Jesus is. Like, be, be washed in his blood. Be forgiven by his grace. Have, have his Holy Spirit come into you. And then learn what he wants to teach you about what it means to serve others in love. Next, he says, their glory is their shame. This one was a little bit weird and took me a while to get, figure out what he was saying too says their glory is their shame, meaning they glory in the things that we find shameful. Have you found that about our culture? You see, what is our glory in? As uh, Those of us who are Christians, those of us who follow Jesus Christ, we glory in the cross of Christ. We boast, meaning we, we take a glory about the cross of Christ. I mean, we don't boast in ourselves or that we've earned it. We boast that Jesus has forgiven us. We boast in the love of God and God's love and his definition of love. And we boast in all good things. See, that's what we should glory in. But I want to let you know, the world wants to take the things that we glory in, the cross of Christ and the love of God, and they want to make that our shame. Have you noticed that? That the world has a tendency to make you want to be ashamed of being a Christian? Uh, have you seen it out there? That we wouldn't boast about the goodness of God or that he's forgiven us, but we become ashamed of the cross. You see, on the other hand, the world wants to take the shameful things, our evil desires, our, our living in the flesh, and they want to glorify those and exalt those up to a, a high place and say, oh, man, isn't this great? Isn't this the way we should all live? You see, conversely, while the world takes glory in what we would call shameful things, God takes our shame and he turns it into his glory. That's what we call a testimony. When we can say, these are the evil, shameful things that I've done. This is everything I did wrong. This is how I don't deserve God's love. This is how I don't deserve his mercy and I don't deserve his forgiveness. And then God says, no, 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 no. I came to save you anyway and it's our testimony. And when God takes your shameful life and he turns it into his glory, that's what it is for us to share the story. I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And God takes our shame and he turns it for his glory. Lastly, it says that those who live, those who are enemies of the cross, focus on earthly things. I've already kind of talked about this a little bit with their God being their stomach, chasing whatever pleases them at the moment. And it says that our focus, on the other hand, it says our focus is in heaven. I actually wrote these creek notes before I fully understood what it was saying. That I wrote, our, our focus should be heavenward. But then yesterday, after re-reviewing this, I realized that our focus wasn't actually heavenward. It says, our focus is on Jesus who comes from heaven. And I thought, oh, we're not just supposed to be focused on heaven in the next life. We're supposed to be focusing on Jesus, and he's just coming from heaven. You see, there, there's a difference because a lot of us focus on heaven as if Jesus came to give us heaven. Jesus came to give us eternal life. And for us, eternal life means the next life. And I want to let you know, eternal life does not just mean the next life, but eternal life means life with Christ here and now. You see, everybody wants Jesus for the next life. 
Because like he's the only one that gives you access. He's the only one building over in the next life. Jesus is building houses in the next life, and he's the only one. If you want a house, you better get with Jesus as your realtor in heaven. He's the only one that can get you in. But that's not what it says. Eternal life is more of this picture of, man, Jesus came to give me his Holy Spirit so that in the here and now I'm focused on him and I realize that I'm a citizen of his kingdom more than anywhere else that demands my allegiance. And so I think scripture is asking us to do two things very clearly and we'll just kind of end here. And so two questions I want to pose to you. Number one is this, less of a question, more of a thought for the week, something to take home and do. Think of people who have a pattern of humility and service. Paul says, set your eyes to those who are living like me. Set your eyes to those who you know. And so I want to ask you the question I've already asked this week. Who in your life has a pattern of humility, a pattern of joy, a pattern of serving other people above themselves? And Paul says, imitate that person. Who is that for you? Write down a couple names and then... Simply this week, attempt to close the gap. Be a little bit more like that person. Be a little bit more like Jesus. As we grow in Jesus, imitate that person as they imitate Christ. You see, I used to think, what a terrible idea. Like, shouldn't we only be focused on Christ? And Jesus is like, no, you you need a little more of a concrete example. You need discipleship. You need someone who is walking in it. So go to that person and say, "I, I just want you to know You're an example for me. They need that encouragement. And then it's going to spur them on their walk because they're like, oh man, I had no idea Matt was watching me. I better step it up. And then they are spurred on and they spur on you. And that's what it looks like to walk in this discipleship relationship. And then two, he ends with this in chapter four, verse one. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and I long for, my joy and my crown. And look at the way he talks about them. He goes, stand firm in the Lord. If you want to be a citizen, stand firm uh, in the Lord. As believers, are you standing firm on Jesus, on his word? Let's be honest, things are crazy in this world right now. It's really easy to be discouraged. It's really easy to be scared. It's easy to be distracted. It is easy to obsess over things which are out of your control right now. Maybe I'm just talking about me. But man, this week, standing firm on the Lord is simply feeding that hope which we have in Jesus Christ and saying, God, I trust in you because everything else in this world is up for grabs. And our foundation is Jesus and he has not changed. So let us stand firm on him. Let's pray. God, I thank you today that you have called us citizens of your kingdom. God, we were, your, your word says that we were once foreigners and aliens. We were enemies. We were actually an enemy nation warring against God. And you invited us to come and be a part of what you're doing. And Lord, you sent us here to colonize this earth. Like Philippi was a colony of Rome. Lord, we realize that that's what a church is. It's an embassy of a foreign power. And God, we're here to let people know not of the glory of Rome, but of the glory of heaven, of the glory of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that each and every one of us would evaluate our own lives to ask, okay, am I really walking with Jesus? Do do I know my salvation is based upon the Holy Spirit, is based upon him, not me? Or am I trying to check things off and be good enough? And Lord Jesus, I simply pray that we would put our identity in the fact that we have been stamped with the blood of Christ. It's not just a visa, it's a citizenship document. And you've given us your Holy Spirit, and I pray that we would recognize that. Lord Jesus, I pray if there's anybody in this room or anybody watching this later on in the podcast or watching this live who says, you know what, I'm not sure if I'm a citizen. I'm not really sure if I belong with Jesus. I pray that you would give them in their identity this hope. Lord Jesus, would you help us realize, Lord, that while we were separated from you, while we were enemies, you came to bring us alongside of you, but it's all your work. Lord, would you lift them up? Would you take hold of them so that they may take hold of the life which you came to bring them? If that's you and you simply want to affirm 
or for the first time or for the 21st time, say, Jesus, I, I forgive me for my sins. Place your Holy Spirit in me. Awaken your Holy Spirit in me. I trade my life for yours. Lord, thank you that you welcome us into your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.